this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Good morning and welcome to chapel on this beautiful fall morning. Um, I'm glad you're here. Uh, Dave Welch is our guest speaker this morning. Uh, Dr. Welch is the associate pastor for discipleship at First Presbyterian Church across the street. Uh, let's welcome him. Um, our help is in the Lord who made the heavens and the earth. Let us worship God. Good morning. This is our faculty ad hoc uh, chapel band. We hope that you'll stand with us as we sing two songs. Our first one is 10,000 Reasons. Please stand.
my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who took our flesh, fullness of God. gift of love and righteousness scorned by the ones he came to save then on that cross let Jesus die the wrath of God was satisfied for every sin on him was laid may be seated. Because we believe that God offers forgiveness and the chance to begin again, we can be honest with God and with one another and with ourselves. Let us pray our prayer of confession responsively. Ever-present God, our lives are filled with distractions, big and small. We confess that like the disciples, we are easily scared by the unknown. We are overcome with worry about illness, tests, jobs, loved ones, and the world as a whole. In our most vulnerable moments, we demand that you answer us when we call to you. But often, we do not listen for you or seek your unexpected, grace-filled presence in our trouble. Forgive us for our demands. Be gracious to us and hear the longing found within our prayers. The Lord says, see, I am making all things new. If anyone is in Christ, Paul says, there is a new creation. In Christ, God is reconciling the world to himself. Friends, believe the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. I want to say good morning, so I will. Good morning. Good morning. 
the uh, rich gift of being invited to share in worship with you all reminds me of the incredible history that this school has in education, but also in worship leadership. I'm blessed to be gathered with you this morning, uh, more so because I'm reminded of the excitement of what worship brings or has to bring for us into our lives, and I know it's early, but the idea of focusing and orienting a life around worship is phenomenal. So thank you for this invitation to come and speak, and for Brian for extending that, and as I read this morning, I'm going to read from a, a very familiar passage, the, the beginning of the Bible, the Scriptures, the book of Genesis. It wasn't until I was well into my 20s um, at seminary did I realize that there are two narratives in the beginning of Genesis about creation that may show you the limitedness of my classic education and so forth. But I'm going to be reading at the pinnacle, taking from the pinnacle of the first narrative when God has been about doing what God does, creating and bringing forth and speaking. And at the very height of this, the pinnacle, the, if you tracked it, it moves up as each thing is created and blessed and ordered. And after each one, you all remember, God says it was good. And I'm going to teach you a great Hebrew word I love. It's called tov which is that word for good. And I'm trying to unpack a little bit of that later. But I'm reading from the first chapter, the 27th verse, and invite you to hear God's word. And God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. And God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Subdue it. And rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And then God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the surface of all the earth and every tree which has fruit yielding seed, it shall be food for you. And to every beast of the earth and to every bird of the sky and to everything that moves on the earth which has life, I have given every green plant for food, and it was so. And God saw all that he had made, and behold, it was very tov. And there was evening, and there was morning the sixth day. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. It was hard for me to believe as I was working on this and preparing for today that about 40 years ago, I was in a similar place like you, my first day of college, my first week of my collegiate experience that maybe some of you, it's not your first week, but perhaps your first year here. And on that first day of my college experience, my parents and my sisters dropped me off, loaded up my room, and it was a small room indeed. I could sit on the bed and reach over and open up my window in one direction and lean over and open up the door on the other. I had a desk and I had a bed and a closet into which all my worldly possessions had been brought forth by my family, including a brand new purchased hi-fi stereo and an electric typewriter. It wasn't self-correcting because I couldn't afford it. You can ask some of your professors what that means. My mother did what moms do, the motherly thing. She hung up all my clothes in the closet, made my bed for the very last time in my life, and then with hugs and kisses, they all departed. I remember this because as I was sitting after they left on my bed, remember I didn't have a chair in my room. I wondered what I was going to go do now. And perhaps per some of you as freshmen may have had that same feeling of angst or bewilderment. Or maybe you've been here long enough now that that is tempered with homesickness. I recognize as I was reflecting on this that college can be an intimidating place, especially when you don't know anybody or anything. Like, what time does the cafeteria open so that I can get some food? And for about 20 minutes, I sat in my funk. And I wondered, have I made a mistake coming here? 
I began wondering as I sat on my bed, what would my college experience is going to be like? Which led to questions like, what would I become? What would I do? Which led to the other questions in my head, would my classes be easy or hard? Could I find easy ones to take? Could I figure out what I would even be good at doing? And then would I have friends, and perhaps I wouldn't frame it in this way, but I thought of it, a significant other? We're confronted with questions whenever we start something new, and especially the invitation as we move into this post-adolescence that our culture celebrates of college experience. And I think this morning the reason for me that I'm bringing it up is that I believe questions of this magnitude and nature are important for us. They're important because we are given an option we can choose to respond to them and not. And I believe one of the principal realities of being in a residential educational experience, a college, a universal, uh, university, is precisely to ask and then to learn answers to those questions. <clears throat> Philosophers call them existential, meanings of existence and purpose. Who am I? What will I be? What am I to do? Well, how am I to respond to the question of who will I be is fundamental to the understanding and development of us in personhood. And because of my calling into my work, I think it's primary even more in our understanding of who we are in faith or faith development. And apparently I'm not the only one that thinks this. You may not have ever looked at your academic catalog that reads, reads in its very beginning. It quotes from John Calvin. It says that nearly all the wisdom we possess, that is to say true and sound wisdom, consists of two parts. The knowledge of God and the knowledge of ourself. A Christian education thus is one that integrates faith and learning and life. And he goes on to say in this statement, the core belief that because God is the creator, sustainer, and redeemer of all life, our knowledge of self, the world, and indeed of God are all interrelated. Those are some pretty strong statements for a school to be making as its orientation to why you're even present here. I'd go a step farther this morning and say that you are expected to wrestle to wrestle with the ideas of identity and purpose. And if you leave King without doing so, then the faculty and administration have failed your education. And perhaps like me, you can go back to this all as an alma mater 40 years later and discuss with them whether or not they completed that task. See, questions of meaning and of purpose are paramount. And to avoid them or not to wrestle with their meaning will short circuit your purpose for being here at King University, whether you're a brand new student or one that's getting ready to graduate. Fortunately for me, at the moment which began my academic journey as I'm sitting on my bed, wrestling with these existential and important thoughts in the midst of my funk, a long forgotten friend from a young life camp two years previous that I had met, came barging into my room, snapping me out of my stupor, and interrupted this mental meandering with the statement, let's go find some women. And off we went, and my college career began. Who am I? Who will I be? What am I to do? Questions that I am inviting you to be thinking about. The writers of Genesis responded to these questions as the basis for all their understanding that was taking place in these two creation narratives, the first of which I've read from and the second which follows. And their answer, their writings, their thinking, their musings, if you will, was this, that who you are is dependent solely upon one thing, and that one thing is God. It is God who in the very beginning of however we want to talk about that, whether it's Big Bang or scientific evolution or whatever, for these, these authors believed that it was God and who in the beginning spoke and creation happened. Philosophers and theologians have a wonderful world of, a word for this of ex nihilo. Out of nothing God brought forth. God spoke. And then the sun and the moon began to know their course. God spoke. 
And out of nothingness came forth vegetation and animals and stars and water. And all took not only their life and form and being, but took into what they were to be doing from formlessness and void is the translation of those Hebrew words, came forth both design and establishment and more purposefulness. The fantastic news of Genesis, and I don't think anybody ever really talks that way, but it's incredible news, is that who you are, the answer to the question of who am I or who will I be, is dependent upon the creative activity, the power and purpose of God, who spoke and you came into existence. Because the narrators and the authors and those who have wrestled with that understanding hold to fundamentally that God is intentional. What God does is not accidental. You being here at the end of that theology statement is, is not by accident, but with purpose and meaning and intent. Because in the Genesis narrative, it is of a God who is purposeful and focused and deliberate and responsive. But I think perhaps even more powerfully understood in this narrative of Genesis is that who we are is inexorably, cannot be unwoven, cannot be untied from the idea of why we are. Who we are and why we are. And God created Man and woman created them in his own image. In the image of God created them, male and female. Everything about this statement starts and ends with and just has one thing in mind, the image of God. Theologians have debated over the centuries, what does it mean to be created into the image of God? Does it mean that in that image we have qualities of thinking and reasoning or personality? Or is it from this image of God in which we have been brought forth? Do we derive an understanding of ethics and righteousness and morality and right and wrong of what we should be or shouldn't be? Or has God created in the image of God who we are refer to the mental and perhaps spiritual faculties that we are invited perhaps to share with the Creator? Is it from the image of God that resides our understanding of reason and personality and free will and consciousness or even intelligence? Others have maintained and argued that the image of God may be a physical resemblance that man looks like God. And so if we look in the mirror, we are invited to recognize God. Or more, that being created in the image of God makes us God's representatives here. The understanding and theology that comes forth in stewardship. And here's my plug. If you want to unpack that a little more, Come on over Wednesday night to First Pres as we are wrestling with that idea of what it means to be stewards. But that's a different story. Who are we? Why are we? Your studies, your time, whether it's four years or like one of my children, five or six years in college, is inviting you to explore and to try out different answers to those questions of who you are. But I would suggest this morning, and it's my job to do this, is that these historical debates are subsumed by an overarching idea, a stronger idea for me, a better idea. The idea is this, that being created in the image of God, we have been given the capacity, the invitation to relate to God. Let me say this differently so that we can hear it with a different ear. Our createdness, this spark of imagery, means that God now can have a personal relationship with each and every one of us. God speaks. God can and does speak to us. Can and then does make covenant with us. God has provided the means, if you will, but not the force 
for a connection, a relationship, which is a special kind of creative activity that involves only man and woman who put us into this unique relationship with the Creator that invited and enabled and responds to us. I said at the very beginning that this word tov was good. And after creating male and female, man and woman, God looked upon it and said, it's not just tov. It's very tov, multiplied in its goodness. If you were ever invited or if you are ever invited to come to my house and visit, I'm not extending that invitation now, so just know that. Or if you have dinner with me or dessert, besides being caught up in the bedlam of family life, you perhaps could experience a variety of relationships that would be offered there. You may or may not, as you enter our home, meet our cat, who initially perhaps would walk by you and ignore you, and then in an instant would turn around and playfully attack you. You probably would meet our dog if she knows you're there. She's going deaf and doesn't recognize a lot of sounds anymore. But once she does know that you are there, she will wholeheartedly believe you are there for her alone and will demand that you pet her. She does this by forcing her head under your hand if you're sitting or walking between your legs if you're standing until you notice her. And although she and I have been together for a long time, there are really only four avenues of communication that all center around her limited vocabulary, which is becoming harder and harder since she can't hear, which is walk, treat, stay, and know. You may develop a relationship with her, but I guarantee you it's not going to be one that's going to be too satisfying. And then perhaps you would meet my children as different from each other as possible, and I need to ask Dr. and Dr. Ong how this could be even be possible since they all have the same genetic material. As children, one of them, if you met them, would talk your ears off. Another, the second one of them, would wear you out playing whatever game he wanted to play. And the third would be happy to quietly sit next to you never engaging you in any conversation. They've grown up into wonderful adults. Finally, though, you'd have the gift of meeting my wife. She's the one who epitomizes the embodiment of relationship. Her name is Linda, and she is gifted for relationships. I'm blessed to have married one who is gifted this way because I won't remember you after I meet you even tomorrow. Ask Dan Christ about that. She finds meaning and purpose in relationships with others, values those above everything else. So gifted is she in this that after meeting her once, if she meets you again in the street ten years later, she will pick up in the conversation where you left off. Each one of these my cat, my dog, my children offer their own understanding of relationship, but only one of them truly fulfills the understanding of that to its best, its goodness, its toveness. You have been created in the image of God. That is who you are. You have been given by that creation the opportunity for the fullest and fullness of relationship that is even possible. At the end of this chapter, chapter 1, immediately after the pinnacle of creation of male and female, God pronounces and looks, you are good, very, very good. And the interesting thing about that Hebrew word for very good is that it carries the idea of goodness for its purpose. Too often we think of, we have truncated the understanding of the word of good in terms of beauty and quality of how something appeals to us. We have taken this broad understanding of the word of good and goodness, implying good for its purpose, and made it into something small and manageable. 
What does it mean to be good for its purpose? If you were to use that Hebrew word for goodness in relationship to God, to food, I mean, it wouldn't mean that the food tastes good or looks good, but it is good for its primary purpose, which is to give us energy, to take away our hunger, to sustain our life and our living. Likewise, a house is good not because it may be beautiful, because its purpose instead is to provide shelter and to protect and to invite others to gather in it. Goodness is always in Hebrew understood in relationship to its purpose. And God looked over the pinnacle of His creation of man and woman and didn't just say it was good, good for its purpose even, but it said it's incredibly great for its purpose. Who are we? I submit this morning that we will only find the answer to that question in and through relationship with the Creator who looks upon each one of you and me as incredibly good. Who longs to be in relationship with you because of that. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Grab a hymn, we'll turn to 834, 834. Please stand for our closing hymn. <laughs> Precious Lord, take my hand, lead me on, help me stand. I am tired, I am weak, I am worn. Through the storm, through the night, lead me on to the light. Take my hand. Lord, lead me home. When my way grows dreary, precious Lord, linger near. When my life is almost gone, hear my cry, hear my call. I fall, take, take my, my hand, hand. Precious Lord, lead, lead me on. Take my hand, hand. Precious Lord, lead me to stay here. Instead, God invites you to go out into the world, continuing to ask those significant questions. Who am I? What am I? What should I be? And to engage in the hard work of discovering the answers. So as you go this morning back into your world, may you be surrounded by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the Father, the communion and fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Now, and forevermore. Amen.
do the tag. Thank you. Clear.